Welcome to Talk in Maine with the Bowtie Boys. Boy, I was a little slow this morning, wasn't I, guys? Well, today we're going to talk about invasive species, and I have with me Nancy Olmstead. Nancy, good to have you here. Thank you so much for taking the time to come up here and do this. Thanks, Tom. You, you know that that Jamoke friend of mine, this Bob Carlton guy. Yes. You know, he and I were talking about invasives. We go way back, and uh, one of the things we, we thought would be a great show to have you come on because people don't know that there are these terrible things that can take over your garden, take over mm -hmm. your forest, mm -hmm. and that we need to be very cautious around them. So tell us who you are, where you work, and uh, then we can find out who the heck is M N. AP. There's so many acronyms out there in this world. Yeah. But let's start with who you are. That would be great. Sure thing. So uh, Nancy Olmstead, and um, I work for the Maine Natural Areas Program within the Maine Department of Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry. Uh, we're a small shop uh, within that large department. And uh, really, you know, we have um, botanists on staff who go out and they uh, look for and keep track of uh, rare plants and special habitats around the whole state. And uh, we use that information with foresters and developers and other kinds of natural resource professionals to help uh, manage development, you know, to give advice about how to take care of those special habitats and features and minimize impacts. Uh, we also um, help private landowners manage the rare plants and special habitats and we uh, help focus land conservation really in the state because of our, our, our database of knowledge of where these kind of special habitats are. So your specialty though is not necessarily rare plants, it's more the invasive side of the business. I mean, you rare got plants, it. Probably tell whoever's in charge of rare plants after they watch this show, I'm going to have them come up and do a show with me because I think that I would find that fascinating as well as this. Yeah. So you're more into the invasive things. So what is an invasive species? Yeah, so um, we, we started the invasive plant initiative because we recognized that invasive species were a threat to those special habitats. And so invasive species are uh, not native to Maine. And you, know, you can get into all kinds of arguments about what does that mean. But um, for our purposes, we sort of look at uh, you know, more or less about 400 or so years ago when Europeans came here because the rate of introductions just really skyrocketed. Obviously, Native Americans moved plants around, but on a, just a different kind of um, scale. So it's not native to Maine. Uh, it can cause some kind of a problem, whether that's an economic problem or an environmental problem, or some of them cause human health problems. Uh, and it, from our perspective at the Natural Areas Program, it's a plant that can invade natural areas. So these are sort of beyond weedy. They're beyond you know, just the side of the road. Um, although they might be in your garden, they might also be in the woods um, or in the wetlands, those kinds of places. So for the people out there, although they are not invasive plants that we can think about as Dutch elm disease, was brought in by the little beetle that had the, the fungus on it that blocks up the, the, the feeder cells inside the tree. That's one that people might identify with. And chestnut blight. Absolutely. Okay. Same thing with um, uh, beech bark disease. And, you know, we've got this horrible threat from the um, emerald ash borer. These are all invasive species. So. And they have no native enemy. That's, that's why they can proliferate as well as they do, because there's nothing that's going to bother them. It's right. like in Japanese bamboo. I'm, I'm sure we'll see pictures of it. Yep. That's horrible. And at the end of the day, as a <clears throat> there's nothing that comes along and eats it here right. in the state of Maine. So yep. it grows prolifically all yep. over the place. So. You might sometimes see a Japanese beetle. I've seen actually the Japanese oh, yeah. beetles on the Japanese knotweed, but not in enough capacity to, 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 to take it really yeah. down. Yeah, that's right, exactly. They don't have their native enemies because they're from real far away. And they also tend to be very flexible plants or, or animals. Like they can live in a lot of different locations. Uh, so the, the bamboo or knotweed, which you just mentioned, um, that plant can uh, survive in you know, wet habitats right by the river, dry, sandy soils, uh, full sun, and in the shade. So there are cases where you've got this knotweed stand under the trees. It's a real bad scene. Um, so definitely yeah, it's a, uh, it's a bad one. I'm sure you've got a picture because that's one that, as I th told you, and I'll even say it again, when we see the pictures of it, my ultimate fear of my little apple orchard I have, I have about 40 trees, and the apple orchards around them are full of the, uh, what's the berry? The bittersweet. The bittersweet. Yeah, bittersweet and, vine. and I still get Japanese knotweed sneaking in there, too, that if I were to come back after not being here anymore, that my trees will be full of them because I keep it out. 
Right. Well, good for you. I mean, that's fantastic. But it, that shows the kind of level of dedication because these plants are so aggressive. Um, do you want to look at a picture of the bittersweet vines? Sure. You're vines? ready. I, yeah. You, yeah, I'm going to go by you. This would be great because I think yeah, people so, get a perspective of what we've got. And uh, thanks for working with the crew to get these pictures. Now, hopefully, they'll come up. Yeah, thanks to the crew for, for working with me. Um, the bittersweet vines, one of the times of year that you can really see them is in the fall. And this photograph was taken in the fall. The, the vines, the leaves turn a bright yellow color. And so as they're sort of draped all over the trees, you can really um, see them. There's an apple orchard on the way to my house that is just full of this. I mean, it's pretty in the fall. I won't right. deny that. But right. it's poor trees. I can just see them yeah. kind of choking underneath them. And right. It's just because they, they, can't, they can't get their own leaves, can't get out there. Right. They're competing in these things for their nutrients and right. food becomes very aggressive for them and takes over. That's a nasty guy. Right, and they can also um, girdle the tree effectively by wrapping tightly around it. Those vines can be, you know, real thick in diameter, so, yeah. When we started the show, I told you that my mother liked to make wreaths out of them because they had the orange berries on them. And so for her, when she was still alive, I planted, bought them at a nursery, <laughs> planted it in yeah. the yard and by my telephone pole because I figured it would climb right, up. Right, right. Well, she passed away and there was nobody to clip them off anymore. And they not only climbed up, they started getting close to the wires. So I basically, and the root, the stalk, the yep. stumps, if you will, yep. were that big. And yeah. it took me probably about three years to dig them out. And then I used that uh, famous pesticide and yeah. I put it on them and they, yep. they're not there anymore. Right, right. But the seeds are all around me. Yep. And so when I walk through my garden or through my orchard, I look for yeah. it and sure enough, I'll find it starting yep. to come back up again. So I'll pull it out and, and then spray the root. So Well, good it. for you. Yeah, it, it's something you do have to keep on top of, you know, once you've got it around you. Um, that's a tenacious one. It's a it's a nice um, character. The roots have that bright orange color on the outside. So you feel like, oh, I really got it when you get all those roots. Yeah, I hate that plant. Anyway. Yeah, it's a tough one. And, you know, there are other plants um, that, you know, they can, they can interfere with the forest succession because they form dense thickets in the understory. Um, they uh, can, 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 like I said, they grow in a lot of habitats and those dense thickets can actually have uh, more ticks than in a, a natural kind of forest understory, which obviously there was just an article yesterday about the incidence of Lyme disease and how it's probably really underreported. And so uh, we, don't, we don't need any more ticks no, <laughs> in the no. main woods. And there, there's another, well, I guess that's not an invasive, though, is it? It's just one that didn't survive well into the wintertime. And, and right. now that we have milder winters, they, they do okay. Yeah, and I think, you know, with, um, you know, in some parts of Maine, we have increasing deer. And so yeah. obviously that's another thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I think I have a photograph of some of the dense thickets of barberry, Japanese barberry wow. in the understory. So if these your are them viewers want it. Yeah. Oh, wow. See those light green shrubs that are kind of taking up space there. Um, do they have the red berries on They them? do have red berries, like a tic tac. They kind of hang down yeah. below the plant. And um, they also have spines, which are real nasty when you're trying to pull out the barberry. You've got to wear your thick leather gloves so that they don't, uh, they don't get so, you. So growing up in New Jersey, that was a horticultural planting where you take it and you would prune it and you could shape it pretty easily. Is it yep. an invasive there or is that a native habitat? No, this is not native to the United States at all. Uh, um, this is an Asian plant, so it's invasive. Yeah. Um, so one time I did plant it in my backyard because I like <laughs> to remember what it looked like with the red I berries. Know, but it I is, know. It, the cold weather has done a number on it, and so I don't believe it's still around. I don't believe. But I well, now it. you'll take a second look, right? Yeah, I will. I absolutely will. Because <laughs> yep. uh, the other one is burning bush. Yes, burning bush is another one. Yep, uh, with that bright uh, red color in the fall. Yeah, so this is how many of these species arrived because they were beautiful horticultural plants and they were flexible and they could grow in a lot of habitats and you know some of them can withstand harsh conditions like in parking lots. So we really uh, need to develop um, some, some good native species that are alternatives to those and I know that there are researchers who've been working on that. Um, some folks down at, at University of Connecticut have developed, have worked on some native plants because, yeah, it, we need, you know, good horticultural plants, but it's great if they can be native because they provide food for the insects, you know, that are co-evolved with these plants. And so they can digest the plant leaves and things and be in turn food for the birds and the salamanders and the frogs and all those good things that we want in our in our forest. You make a really good point. Probably one of the reasons that insects, they don't have an enemy is because the animals can't digest this you got vegetation. It. You got so it. So a deer, you sit there and say, oh, there's plenty of green on that Japanese knotweed. No, they can't digest it. That's it right. It doesn't taste good to them. It's like right. broccoli to them. 
I like broccoli, Tom, broccoli, so I'll defend too. broccoli. We grow some good broccoli here in yeah, Maine, right? Broccoli. Yeah, but Bro you're, broccoli and Brussels sprouts, cold crops. I love them. But, yeah. But no, but you're right. You're yeah. right. The insects, they 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 don't have the right, you know, bi biota in their gut, or it just doesn't taste good to them, like yeah. you said. So they're they're not eating it. Same thing with the deer. Uh, you know, deer are no dummies. You put a nice barberry in front of them with all those spines. Ooh, no, thank you. So no, no. So yeah. What else have we got with, with invasive? Yeah, so we got a lot. Um, we've got shrubby honeysuckles. These are um, yeah, shrubs that, again, people planted. They love the smell of the flowers. Um, so is it a vine? There, there is a vine. We don't really have the, the vining one very much in Maine. Um, mostly what we have are shrubby ones. And, um, you know, they have opposite leaves. And they come. the leaves come out real early in the spring. So sometimes if you're driving along, you can look off in the woods and see this this flush of light green leaves, and, and that's the shrubby honeysuckle kind of getting the leg up on our native plant. Do they have plant. the same flower the honeysuckle does? Kind of a, I don't know how to describe it, but it's kind of wispy with like open yes. up. And, and, yep. and then if you take it off and suck the bottom of it, it's got a little bit of sweetness to it. That's really just the vine, um, the Japanese uh, honeysuckle vine. Um, I actually, there's a, there's a location down in um, West Bath, and for the first time, I met that plant in person and you know sucked some of the nectar myself. And I can see why people planted it, right? But it's another thing like the bittersweet vine, where the the vines will just climb all over the trees and. Um, so luckily we don't have too much of that, but the uh, shrubby honeysuckles, boy, I was up in uh, Southern Aroostook County where they've got wow. such great rich soil. Real problem up there um, in some of the you know previous uh, ag fields and those kinds of edges of forest and all over the state. So wow. um, shrubby honeysuckle is a very shade tolerant plant. So that's one of the reasons it's such a- Do we know the origin of some of these? Yeah, most of them are from Asia or Europe. Um, you know, that's the bulk of them. Uh, we don't have a climate here that yet really supports plants from Africa, those kinds of places. So Asia and Europe are where most of these are from. So what are, what are the kinds? I mean, you yeah. some great pictures. So we hit, on, we hit on the honeysuckle. Uh, we which already talked about the burning bush, which you got up there. Bush? That's burning bush yeah. with that red foliage in the fall and a bird dispersed fruit. So a lot of these plants yeah. that we've talked about so far, the barberry, the bittersweet, the burning bush, um, the honeysuckle, they have fruits that even though the insects don't eat the plant, the birds will eat the fruit to some extent. Uh, and and so, comes, exactly. So I, I have burning bush in my yard. Yep. And because it's, it was pretty. I, mean, I understand. I no longer have it. In, well, I have it on one side of the house. The other side of the house, I killed it. Good job. But I noticed on my neighbors in the back part that she was just letting come back naturally. Uh -huh. There's burning bush in there. Uh, so, but it's on her property, so I can't take care of it. But that's it was, and I because I didn't plant this. I there. know. And it's like I it know. must have disseminated from they the seeds. They do that. And I, that's that, exactly that particular, what happened. Particular uh, species. Yeah. And got a whole foot and, and you can see that one in the fall so easily because of the color. I mean, you could knock on the door and say, "If you don't want those burning bushes, I'm sorry. I'll be happy to pull them up for you." <laughs> I get an easier way. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. Good. That's true. Yeah, that too. That works too. Herbicide works what, fine. What about? Uh, or maybe you have a picture of Rosa rugosa. I sure do, yeah. Um, well, I don't have Rosa rugosa, excuse me. Um, that is an invasive plant, though, right along the coast especially. Um, it, you know, again, very beautiful plant, very hardy, good for those wind-swept parking lots with salt spray. But unfortunately, on our beaches, um, that plant can get real established and, and push out the dune grasses that would be the natural habitat there. Um, I don't get real fussed about it, like here in Farmington, if it was in a parking lot. You know, it's not ideal. It would know, be nicer if we had a native plant that could do well in that parking lot. But along the coast, that is where the rugosa grows. Does that rose. one have like a big pink flower on mm -hmm. it? Yep. Like, I got that in my azalea plants. <clears throat> and it's not there anymore, because, but it took some time to get it out. And it was, <clears throat> just like you described, it started as, oh, this is a pretty, you know, it's a right. perennial. It's pretty. Yep. And the next thing I know, it literally had taken over the side bed. And I said, this has got to go. Yep. It's and it has really uh, fine the, spines yep. on it. All along the stems. Yeah. Yep. We have another rose that's invasive, uh, multiflora rose. It's a white flowered rose with like a one inch wide white flower in mid-June. I got a picture of that one too, um, showing the white flowers. Does it sit right here? That's it. Yep. Wow. That's in my neighborhood. They can just really pump out a lot of uh, flowers and fruits and seeds. And this one has uh, backward pointing thorns. Boy, another one that, you know, it's real hard, It's real unpleasant to work with once you get that. What, what family species of plant is that in? Is yeah, it's, it's in the rose family. It is in the rose family. Yep. 
Exactly. So same family as apples yes, and yeah. many other fruit crops. Yeah. So is it? It's a fruit. Will is it going to be like uh, a little bit bigger? This one is small. So mm -hmm. the the rugosa rose hip is pretty big. Yeah, yeah it's a People big red, red bulb, uh, if I remember correctly. The multiflora. Uh, there are many flowers clustered at the tips. So there are many, uh, like third of an inch wide. Um, many small fruits clustered at the twig tips. Um, I don't have a winter picture, but sometimes I can see it uh, even on the highway because you can kind of see the reddish color where all the fruits are clustered. Um, so that it's a it's much smaller. You wouldn't use it for like jams or anything like that the way that some people yeah. use rugosa. But so that that literally is another invasive. That it is. Wow. Yep, and that one's you know not as shade tolerant as like your honeysuckle or your barberry or your bittersweet, but it's moderately shade tolerant. So like in the woods, I find. Um, I find another plant, glossy buckthorn, and sometimes I find some multiflora rose in addition to like the honeysuckle and the barberry and the bitters. The, uh, uh, buckthorn that's up there now. You got it. Yep, that's the glossy buckthorn. So there's a leaf somewhat like a beech. Yes, exactly. I and um, but no teeth on the edges. Yep. But yes, the very straight venation does remind me of beech. But then the fruits obviously are, are juicy and round. They start off as green, they turn red, and then they go to black. And a single glossy buckthorn can have all three colors at the same time, which, you know, it could be useful for IDing it if you're not that familiar. Now, see, is, is that what they call a serrated edge on a leaf that's like a if, beach? If it is like a beach, yeah. See, I'm Toothed right. or serrated, exactly. See, you I got can it. Remember, I'm not that old. I can remember my forestry <laughs> stuff. I Bob bet. will be impressed. I hope you're watching. I'm glad you're impressed. <laughs> well, that dendrology, you know, that's yeah, burned that's in right. there. Dend yeah. I had a dendrology teacher. Thank God he didn't take off for spelling. <laughs> um, so yeah. It, wow, those are fascinating. And I, I've, I've think of buckthorn I've seen and didn't know what it was. I, I always thought it was more. It's like an alder leaf too. Very similar. And it is very the similar. The fruit is somewhat similar too, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, the alders have those little catkins, which almost oh, yes, look yeah, like yeah. pine cones. Yeah, so yeah, that yeah, might yeah. be a little yeah, different. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. the leaf is similar, except the glossy buckthorn does not have teeth. Yeah, so, okay. yeah, and but it can grow in similar habitats. The glossy buckthorn is a little bit like the knotweed, grows in wet, dry, sun, shade, deep shade. Like I, the glossy buckthorn is a plant that I've actually found in hemlock forests. Wow. Which really scares me because you know those are some Dark, places yeah. where you don't normally find uh, you know invasive plants because they're they're shady, they're acidic in the soil. So that's one that actually is is a is a one that I'd like every forester in Maine to be able to identify glossy buckthorn at thirty paces without question. Yeah, well, wow. <laughs> in the understory part reminds me that in the south one of the biggest invasive is kutsu. Right. That, and if you've ever been down south, it just has taken over the understory of many of those forests yep. down there. So yep. it'd be similar. Yep. Wow, these are great. I, if you don't mind, Bob, I'll, I'll go, while please, we're on, go, Bob, go. I just called you Bob. Excuse me, That's Tom. Right. Don't um, call me Bob. <laughs> I don't want to think that he's. That you think I'm Bob? No, no. no. I'm only kidding, Tom, um, I've been called worse. <laughs> Not much worse than Bob, but that's okay. We were just talking about Bob Marvini, so he's on my yeah. mind. Yeah, so um, there's one more shade tolerant um, plant that's a real concern to the forest that I want to make sure everyone's aware of. Um, and so I'm going a little out of order here, but it's the uh, stilt grass or Japanese stilt grass. And this is a brand new detection in Maine last fall. And this is a, a understory grass that can carpet the whole understory of the forest. Um, I don't know if we've got the picture is up. That, is this it right but, here? Uh, yes, exactly. Uh -huh. And so um, it's a real delicate looking small grass, uh, can grow about two feet high, and just forms these horrible dense stands, uh, even in the dense understory, of, shaded understory of the forest. Just a picture of what that You got be. it, exactly. Uh -huh. um, so this is one that uh, has been a real problem in forests to our south, and we just detected it in two locations in the fall, um, one in York County and, and one in Georgetown, Maine, in Sagatahawk County. So again, this is one that I'd really love if every, if every natural resource professional was looking out for stilt grass because we want to make sure that we nip it in the bud and don't let it spread into our forest. So when you detect it, like those yep. two sites, will you go in and eradicate it as best you can? We will. So, so these are both private landowner sites, and so with their permission, um, we are helping. Um, and so uh, uh, the landowners have been very gracious uh, wanting to do the right thing. Um, unfortunately, neither of these infestations are real small, so it's going to be a long-term project. But yes, we are working with those landowners. 
Um, I have a grant request um, into the, the U.S. Forest Service, um, so fingers crossed that they'll give us some funding to assist with those efforts because, you know, I, I'm a staff of, uh, of one, one plus yeah. a few in the summer, and uh, that'll be real helpful for us to wow. um, assist those landowners, but yeah. All right, so what other pictures do we have as we're getting? Yeah, up? great. Um, so uh, you got a two pager. I'm impressed. I know, I know. I'm such a I'm you such did a Girl good. Scout. This is great. Well, we haven't shown a photograph. I don't think of the knotweed yet. Yes, so the yes, Japanese nice. knotweed, or some people call it bamboo. Um, I think the photograph I have is of a of a dense stand on the right camp. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so there's a, a stand there right beside the access road for a forestry site on one of the Bureau of Public Lands sites. Uh, it can be a real nuisance when you're trying to, you know create a landing for your for your timber operation or you know around your house but also takes up uh, a lot of space in the woods and can displace native right. plants. I remember when we had an early spring where uh, it came and then froze and every one of those guys got hammered by that and I thought oh great this is going to be what it takes to get rid of them. No, no. their roots were still yeah. alive and they just grew more through thicker than they yep. were before and looked at a piece of property in Starks that it was up and down the riverbank. Mm -hmm. And interesting, and it, maybe you can correct this, but I called the DEP and said, if I bought this property, can I take them out? And the answer was no. They're part of Sherland zoning stuff. I think that's something yeah. gotta, we have to have a conversation about. They you. and and I since you know I don't know how long ago that was, Tom, but um, they have put in some exemptions in Sherland zoning for invasive plants. And you know the concern always is to make sure that there are some Thanks. plants yeah, on right, in right. place to keep there from being erosion. So they want there to be a replanting plan so that you know there's a gradual transition. Um, but yeah, the hard part was that this is all rocky. Yes. So you couldn't really replant if you took them out. You couldn't yeah, really replant them. You know that would have yeah. been a really tough case. So it, yeah. Yeah. But if it, if it uh, if if I had bought the property, I would have found a way to get rid of them. So, there you go. But I didn't. Yeah. I didn't. Yeah. All yeah, right. yeah. That's yeah. great. That that one's a very tenacious guy. Yeah. It's and it's, if you go on, if anybody wants to see that, if you drive to Wilton on Wilson Stream on the left hand side, it's all that Japanese bamboo or. Yeah whatever it is. Yeah, the knotweed. Yes, it, knotweed. it's a very tenacious plant. Um, you know, you bring up a good question, which is what do you do about these plants, right? So maybe you have these on your property or you're a forester and you see them on your timber cruise. Um, you know, I think uh, the first thing to do is to learn to identify them. And I know when you had yes, Bob Colton yep. on, he, uh, he, he highlighted you our- one. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, um, uh, you're very we, welcome. We Absolutely. The, um, and let me kind of center in on this Yeah, thing. there. There's... We've got our main invasive plants field guide. Uh, so this has uh, 42 or 43, gosh, I don't remember now, 46 species in it. And it's got a page for each plant uh, with photographs and uh, tips for how to identify it. So the first thing, you know, obviously is you got to know you have a problem. So uh, on your Purple land. Purple loosestrife, yes, that's mm -hmm. another pain in the neck plant. It took me, I thought that was a very pretty plant. So I dug it out, brought it home, <laughs> and it was, it was beautiful for years. Yeah. Um, and then it died back, which was interesting, but I have it all over the place. So every year I'm pulling it out. Yep. You, I'm sensing a recurring theme oh, here. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's part of, you know, people see the pretty flowers. And I know. This is a great perennial. It comes back and not realize yep. it's going to yeah, spread. Yeah. So, so now the, you've gone to the landowner and you've given them some advice on how they get rid of it. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, this also has advice on treatment. Um, and, and reporting is helpful, too. So we have an online mapping tool called IMAP Invasives, and it helps everybody understand where things are in the landscape. Um, you know, when I go out and I survey on the public lands, I'm reporting what plants I find into there. And, uh, you know, if, if we were on private land, we would report with permission of the landowner. Um, right. And so that's a good tool and a nice practice so that, again, you know, the more we know about where they are, the more we can be keeping an eye open. Um, and then in terms of um, hands-on help, uh, we have a new program in my department through the Maine Forest Service. So uh, we received a grant from the U.S. Forest Service to start a program where uh, the Maine Forest Service is going to be running an invasive plant academy for mm -hmm. foresters and other natural resource professionals. And once folks have graduated from the academy, um, they can write uh, invasive plant control this plans. Is the, uh, the you got it. The yeah. website there for this program. They can write control plans for landowners, and the landowners, um, you know, once the plans are approved, they will get up to a 50% wow. um, financial incentive to get the plan. 
uh, so up to half the cost of the plan. And then there'll be a, a management component where people can apply for uh, contractor applied treatments that the main forest service will hire a contractor to come and treat the infestations. So it's really a three-pronged approach, and that's getting on the off the ground this calendar year. So the uh, website that your folks are showing. Yeah, why don't we put the website up, guys, if we could? <laughs> so it's it's got to run right around here Terrific. in a second. I'm, it's coming. Yeah. But, uh, that, that way people can get in touch. It's www.maine.gov backslash DACF, Department of Agriculture, Conservation, Forestry, backslash MNAP. Yeah, and that's the, that's the website of the Maine Natural Areas Program. And um, I'm not sure if we have a link yet from that website to the Forest Service, but if you search for Maine Forest Service Invasive Plant Management Program, it'll be the first thing that comes up. Um, you and need to talk to the state forester. I know, well, I can do that. <laughs> I can do that too, showing those down the road. Um, You've got a great asset there right in town. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. Patty has been phenomenal since she got here, and when that opening was there, there were a number of us who stepped up to say she's the person, and yeah. she's the person. Although I think she's scratching her head what she's done to herself, but that's all right. <laughs> so we're getting close to the end. Do we have yep. more pictures that we need to hit on before... Uh, before we get to the Yeah, bird. so um, there's another plant, uh, which is a tree, actually, Tree of Heaven, that I want Chinese to... Chinese Tree of Heaven. Uh, Multiple yeah. leaves. Yes, it's got real big uh, compound leaves, sort of like an ash tree, um, but the compound leaves can be as, as long as my arm. Um, yeah. And there this is... is yeah. Yeah. yeah, with those kind of elm-like seeds. Yeah. And uh, this is not very common in Maine at all, which is a good thing. Um, because it's invasive and aggressive, but it's also the host for a very destructive insect pest called spotted lanternfly, uh, which, you know, knock on wood, we also don't have yet in Maine, um, but in states to our south like Pennsylvania, and it's in New York now, this is causing a lot of problems because it goes after grapes and apples and hops and, you know, uh -huh. all those good things that we want to so grow. You think that, get rid of I know. <laughs> Yeah, so we don't want Tree of Heaven because we don't want Spotted Lanternfly and because Tree of Heaven is invasive in and of itself. So if folks see Tree of Heaven, I would ask them to report it to, to IMAP Invasives or, or to my program, the Maine Natural Areas Program. Um, it, it's, a, it's one that we want to, again, help landowners to get rid of. Or the Maine Forest Service might be able to use them as trap trees to... Uh, detect any spotted lanternfly that might be in the area. Yeah, growing up in New Jersey, that was all over the place. Yes. I also, I, I spent a little time in New Jersey. I was there for high school, and I, I didn't really know the natural world that well then. But, boy, my colleagues who work in New Jersey in the tri-state area, they have some real bad invasive plant and problems. And it's one that would grow out of the cracks in the concrete. That's how bad it was. It was a tree grows in Brooklyn. That yeah, was that the was plant. That, yes, that's yeah. correct. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. There's one more plant that I should share with uh, your viewers, and that's the common reed or phragmites. This is a real, real, real tall grass that grows in wet spots, salt marshes. It can grow along logging roads. Um, you can see Certainly the standing. Wow. Yep, the standing dead plants are this kind of tan brown color in the in the winter time, uh, with the seed heads up at the top. So this is another one um, that you know, boy, if you can nip it in the bud uh, while it's just a small patch, that's really great because once it gets to be a real big patch like that, it's just a real challenge and to that, work with. That, I, it, there are places like that along the interstate. That, yes. Yeah, so that yes. is the tall grasses that we see along yes. the interstate. Yes. Wow. Sometimes. Yes. There are patches of that along the interstate, and I know that um, you know Maine DOT and um, Maine Turnpike Authority are are, are are trying. They're aware, I think, but um, they also have uh, other mandates like safety yeah. and those kinds of things that come first. So. So so at the end of the day, if people see an invasive uh, either this show or have a question, they yep. should contact you through the the website. Can we put the website up again, guys? That would be great so people can see it. For more information, go there. There are phone numbers that are there that they can call. Or they can call the department and ask that's for right. Invasive Feces Program. Yep. Anything real quick that's sitting out there that you worry about besides, like, Chinese Tree of Heaven that you see, like, in Massachusetts <sighs> that somebody wow. might decide? It's, to it's the, the, the stilt grass um, that we talked about. And also uh, there is a um, mile-a-minute vine, which is a, another vine. It's not woody like the bittersweet, but it's a... It's a, it's a spiny vine and it kind of sprawls over things. So mile a minute vine is another one. I don't have a photograph of that one. Um, 
but yeah, the, the, the stilt grass and the um, tree of heaven are important. Um, so the last question I have for yes, you, have sir. the nurseries then stopped selling some of these things? Yes, so uh, we worked with the nurseries to get uh, a do not sell list of plants in place. And so there are 33 uh, plants that are prohibited from sale. Um, and, and you know that was done on a committee with, with representatives from the industry. So that's a step in the right direction. Well, this, this is fantastic. I really appreciate you coming up here and doing this. My it's pleasure. A, it's a, it's something we all should be aware of. Like I said, the ultimate fear I have is someday they are going to take over. It's, and it's a lot of work to get them out of there. And, right. you know, these uh, apple orchards that I know about, nobody's ever going to take and take care of it because they're abandoned. Yeah. And uh, that's a lot of work to take care of right. them unless a forester gets hired like, right. like Bob or someone right. else to be responsible. Yeah, we have to really be vigilant to look out for them. So I want to thank you for coming on the show. It's my pleasure. Thank you for Appreciate having it. me. Thanks, Nancy. Yeah. So you guys got some homework to keep an eye out when spring comes around for looking for those invasives, and you've got a contact to make if you find some. We'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in for Talking Maine with the Bowtie Boys. Bowtie Boy. Just me.